Okay, Jim, if you want to get rolling, we'll start now. Thank you, Michael. So we should be going into screen show and hopefully you can see uh, my slides on screen. Uh, sing out, Michael, if you can't see them. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and as Michael remind you, if, if you're finding lots of videos overlaying the slides, uh, you can control at the very top of the video box and uh, move some of those away. Mm -hmm. um, thank you all. It's interesting to uh, see some very familiar um, faces, colleagues in Australia who I haven't seen for a while, uh, as well as a few who I work with. Um, and uh, very exciting to have some PhD students uh, with us. Uh, and boy, I'm hearing Michigan, Minnesota, Tennessee. That's great. So welcome all. Um, I thought I would just start, uh, and I'm not going to introduce myself in any great detail. Uh, you can Google me. Some of you know my background. Um, uh, perhaps the only unusual thing at the moment is uh, I am normally a distinguished professor in the School of Communication at UTS, working with Maureen, um, but for my sins for the last two years now, I've been Deputy Dean of the UTS Faculty of Science, working with scientists. Um, and that's a long story we can talk about one day, but um, it's, uh, it's quite fascinating as a communication person working across disciplines that are, that are quite so so different, um, but very challenging and very interesting. <clears throat> I thought I'd just start by uh, the topic, obviously, I'm going to talk about is organizational listening. And I'm going to talk about uh, some of the findings of my research. But what I think will also be useful to some of you is, is I'll also go into the methodology, some of the challenges of the methodology, some of the, the difficulties you run into in doing it. So I'll try and give you some of the behind the scenes uh, rather than just the glorious findings when the research is finished. Uh, and I think that might be useful. I also just wanted to explain a bit why talking about listening might be relevant because when you, even when I first started this project, people would say to me, why are you studying organizational listening? What's that got to do with what we do? And of course, to me, there's many links because if, if you're working or studying public relations, uh, we know that it's theorized, at least as two-way communication, um, not always symmetrical, of course, but it, it, if, even if it's asymmetric, there has to be some level of two-way communication in public relations, particularly if we want to build relationships. I think every one of us knows that if you don't do any listening, it's pretty unlikely you'll have good relationships, either personally or with organizations. Um, I know a couple of you um, mentioned working in digital media um, when, you were, when you were chatting then, um, and, and even in some of the digital, or some people still call it new media, um, the whole promise of social media and digital media was that they could be interactive. Um, and uh, the, I put some references in there. I'm using an older version of your Kulanisalan on the listen but uh, he talks about that that's the whole benefit is it's an interactive uh, platform uh, many of you uh, i know i appreciate Anne, Anne's comments uh, dialogue is a very important area of research and i and i acknowledge that michael and maureen have really led in this area and Anne has done some great work in this area um, and we do we need to have dialogue with our with our stakeholders uh, as communicators but of course, if you just take dialogue literally, it comes from the Greek uh, dialogos, and dia just means through, and logos means argument or reasoning. In other words, it's through speech. Um, now, we implicitly uh, assume that listening is part of dialogue, um, but of course, it's very important to make sure listening is present in dialogue. Otherwise, it just becomes no more than two people speaking and perhaps not listening to each other. And I'm sure we've all seen that in the real world where you see people talking and no one's listening. Um, a number of you mentioned engagement, um, another very important area. I know Anne works in, in this area as well. And the term engagement is used extensively by our colleagues in marketing. Um, it's almost a prototypal buzzword, oh, we're engaging. But often what they mean is someone clicked on a website or someone liked them on social. And of course, that's not really engagement. And if we are uh, having engagement, we know it's a much deeper uh, association. Um, it's got uh, cognitive elements. It's got an emotional connection, but also most... Uh, most psychological uh, definitions. A logical framework approach uh -huh. in communication. You will see that the model shows five stages. 
these types of models. Someone else hearing something. I'm hearing another presentation. Recommended. Well, hold on. I think actually that's me, Jim. I'm actually doing our Mel lessons. Hold on, just one second. I'm going to mute you. So. Um, engagement, of uh, course, is a psychological concept with uh, cognitive elements, but an emotional connection. But also, most definitions say there has to be some form of participation or a behavioral ele element. Uh, and again, so that participation is is got to be involving listening. You could be studying democratic politics, and uh, I think Mitchell's Mitchell's got a background in, in in politics and political communication. In democracies, you know, we know vox populi, the voice of the people, and we talk a lot about voice. But what's the purpose? What's the benefit of voice unless people are listening to that voice? And uh, you could also come from an ethics point of view or a diversity point of view. And again, that if we're not listening to some groups and we know that some groups in our, in our community are not listened to. So to me, there was so many ways you could come at it. Uh, and it was interesting, I think Paul uh, was talking about strategy. Um, and it's fascinating to look at strategy because it comes from, a, again, another Greek term where originally it was about sort of winning in battle, uh, sort of a strategic approach of achieving the, the organization's goals. But if you look at strategy in a contemporary sense and concepts like emergent strategy, it's now very much about understanding stakeholders and being adaptive and working with stakeholders. So to me, even studying contemporary strategy, you find that there's got to be an element of listening to others. You can't just simply uh, enforce what the organization wants to do. So I thought I would just throw those points in that um, it was through coming to think about all these different areas that I started to think, you know, in, in so many of them, listening is something we need, but actually it's not really talked very much about. Um, so just a little bit of theory. Um, and I like to use simple headings, like a bit of theory. Yeah, my slides are not moving. Um, the very word communication, uh, it's worth reminding ourselves occasionally that it comes from the Latin noun communicatio, which means it does mean imparting, but it also means sharing, sharing and imparting. Um, and uh, we've had Peters write a lot about that in the past. Um, it's also the, the similar Latin verb communicare is about sharing or making common or being in relationship with. And of course, both of those terms come from the Latin root communis, which is where we get terms like community. And so at its very heart, and not to be confused with communications with an S on, uh, that the telecommunications industry seems to have uh, seconded and sequestered and, and taken to mean something else that's all about transmission. Uh, communication at its very heart is about the sharing of, of meaning or coming to a common understanding. Um, getting away from ancient terms, uh, I really like the work of Robert Craig, uh, a leading uh, US communication scholar, and he very, very succinctly says communication is simply speaking and listening. And I, and I really loved reading that phrase uh, some years ago because I thought no one has actually, actually just come out and said it quite so simply. My good friend, Nick Caldry, who I work with at, at London School of Economics, uh, where I'm a visiting professor, has written about it as well, because Nick writes a lot about voice and, and, uh, and his work is very, very important. But he described voice uh, back in 2009 as being the implicitly linked practices of speaking and listening. And um, like Anne and I got into a big conversation one day, Nick and I met through having this very long debate about me saying to him, Nick, it can't be implicit. We need to make it explicit because if voice is just the implicitly linked practices, what tends to happen is that speaking is very obvious. And if you look at the, the fields we work in, I mean, we're all highly trained in speaking. And I don't just mean verbally, we're trained in writing, we're trained in producing videos, we're trained in producing websites. Um, the dominance of our education is about producing and distributing information. Um, but where, where are we equipped for listening? Um, and of course, Nick subsequently, when he wrote his book on, on voice, actually came out and said he acknowledged that without listening voice is valueless it has no value at all so when we too do look at our society and uh, i know um, a couple of you are looking at diversity looking at uh, various groups looking at storytelling uh, whatever you're looking at uh, unless there is listening um, that it tends to be be quite deficient in my view 
then a bit of missing theory. So you might say, well, hang on, listening is talked is actually talked about a lot uh, and written about a lot, and that's true. Um, but what I started doing in about 2013, 2014, was doing a, a very large um, a literature review. And of course, we all know that doing a really solid literature review is very, very important to good research, because if you think there's a gap, you've got to be sure of it. And the last thing you want to do is just replicate what someone else has done. What I found is that there is an enormous amount of theory and discussion of interpersonal listening. We find it in psychology, we find it in leadership studies, uh, not that all our leaders do listen, but at least it's there. Certainly it's in HR literature and actually a lot of the, the listening literature is in therapeutic fields. Um, and so there is this enormous amount, but it's always about listening in dyads or in very small groups. And what I found, and it was really intriguing to me, was how an, orga how an organization might listen or not listen is actually largely ignored. And organizations, um, I don't think I need to say to you, organizations are very important because we live in complex uh, industrial or post-industrial societies in which organizations play a very, very key part. They, they dominate our lives, whether we, everything from the local businesses to your phone company, to the hospitals, to the police, uh, to the insurance company, the tax office, there's nowhere we go in life without interfacing with organizations. And so I was just intrigued to know that, well, how would an organization listen? Um, and I'll come back to, to that in a moment, why are organizations different? Um, I also looked at literature on uh, in political science, uh, and it wasn't just me. Uh, Susan Bigford wrote a, a really important book uh, a number of years ago, back in 1996, where she said listening was uh, largely absent in political science. And Andrew Dobson followed that up with a book in 2014 um, that really critiqued politics in terms of listening. Uh, as I mentioned, Nick Caldry's talked a lot about uh, voice in, within the importance within sociology, um, but also voice often without listening, and even in business and management. And then ironically, last and I came to PR and corporate communication, and I thought, well, public relations, there'll be, there'll be certainly talk about listening in public relations. And yes, I did find some literature, but it was very, very instrumental. It was uh, some of the leading textbooks. In fact, I analyzed 14 of the leading textbooks and only two of them actually used the word listening anywhere in the book. And both of those talked about listening so you could understand the audience in order to better target the audience. So it was this instrumental approach where we want to listen in order to serve our own interests. Now, the question you might be asking yourself is, well, so if we have all this, lit this literature on listening and an interpersonal sense, why can't we just apply that to listening? Because after all, I'm not trying to anthropomorphize organizations. It is people in organizations that listen. But organizations are distinctly different for, different for a couple of reasons. And those are, these, are, these are three things that we need to bear in mind. An organization, unlike you and I in a personal conversation or talking in a very small group, organizations very often listen, need to listen at large scale. Um, organizations have thousands or even millions of customers. Many organizations have hundreds of thousands of employees. Uh, governments need to listen to large numbers of voters, uh, etc. And they don't all necessarily speak at once. But if they are deciding policy or making decisions, they should listen to a reasonably large representative selection of those people. So organizations, uh, and Andrew Dobson talked about this in his book, when he, and it really struck me when he said, organizations face the challenge of scaling up. How do you scale up listening uh, to, to the sort of level that an organization might need to? The, the large scale then leads to the second issue is that an organization has to delegate listening. So the CEO or the management board can't possibly with their ears listen to everything that they might need to hear. So listening is delegated to groups like customer relations, uh, to HR departments, to research companies, sometimes to social media monitoring teams, and so on it goes. So listening in organizations is delegated. And that then leads to the third issue, 
that listening in organizations is mostly mediated. It doesn't happen synchronous, synchronously through our ears. It tends to happen through correspondence, letters, emails, submissions, complaints, and so forth. And so these were three very, very important things for me to bear in mind that organizations, most of the knowledge we have about listening doesn't really apply. Yes, it applies ultimately when you get to the board, the decision makers, they should be able to listen to their advisors. But along the way, the voice, the voice that Nick Caldry talks about of all of those stakeholders has to travel through mediated means, through delegated departments and units at large scale, all the way up to try to reach management. And so that was kind of the background that had me start to look at what, what I called the organizational listening project. And um, it's been done in three stages. And I'll just quickly talk a bit about stage one, and then we might pause and welcome any questions and discussion. Uh, and I'm peeking at chat as we go, but I think there's just uh, our surveillance and espionage. Uh, I will come back to uh, those types of listening because listening, uh, there's listening in can be done for ethical reasons and listening in can be done for uh, very uh, dysfunctional purposes. So I will come to that point. Um, the I put these on, on, on the slides because the two documents on the left are both uh, open source, free online. Um, the first document the, on the far left uh, is the report of stage one that's available on the, w, on the UTS website. The, the middle document is a very lengthy report that I wrote after stage two um, when I was working and living in the UK. Uh, and that, cre that quote, creating a democracy for everyone, was a very famous quote by Theresa May when she became prime minister, uh, but didn't last very long. And the document on the right is, uh, is a book that you'll have to subscribe to my superannuation to be able to buy that one. Um, just joking. Trying to get the slides to move again. Uh, so just quickly talk about stage one. I thought after that background that I've just talked about, I thought I need to go and I need to go and really look at this in some detail. So how will I do it? And so I decided that doing surveys was was not really going to be the answer. Our industry is uh, very in love with doing quantitative surveys. Um, but I think you can imagine and, th and think as researchers along with me here, if you did a survey, do we really think uh, organizations are going to tell us the truth? If I said to them, do you really listen to your customers? I was thinking, they're all going to say, yes, oh, we are great. We listen to our customer. So I was thinking, you really got to think through the methodology here. So I thought what I need to do is I want to do in-depth interviews with senior communication related managers. And I'll explain the term communication related at the moment, because there was no one site, as I said, listening is delegated. And so I ended up doing up to seven interviews in many organizations, and I'll explain why. The second thing I then did is content analysis of a lot of documents from those organizations that agreed to participate. Because if they said, for example, that they did stakeholder engagement or they did public consultation, I didn't take that as legitimate unless I, they could show me a document that demonstrated that they did engagement. So this was a way of validating the information. Many of them claimed they did public communication, so public consultation. Okay, let me see the report of the consultation. And I was quite, I, I signed confidentiality agreements with many of them. I didn't want to report the detail, but I wanted to see the evidence because a lot of claims were made. Um, I even got down to um, evaluating job descriptions because many people told me, oh, you know, I'm the chief listening officer of my organization. Okay, let me read your job description. Funnily enough, it didn't mention listening. Um, it was it was very, very different. And the third thing we then did, and this again is a, is a methodological issue, is we did some field experiments. Uh, and this, we didn't do, these weren't artificial. We thought we can't trick organizations. That would be unethical. But working with a number of colleagues, um, anyone, any time we could find there was a genuine inquiry or a question or a comment that we wanted to make to an organization, let's submit those comments to organizations and let's monitor what happens. Uh, and just as one little aside story, it just so happened at the time, 
I was interested in buying a new car uh, from a certain manufacturer. And I didn't know whether this new model was going to be available in Australia because it's often released somewhere else first. And so I posted on the website with a invited comments, a question about when will Model X be available in Australia? I am interested in buying. I never heard from the company, never got a response. That's just one little example. And I thought to myself, this is crazy. They built this website. They say, tell it, give us your say, tell us what you want. Yeah, talk to us. I'm, inter I'm a customer. I'm interested in buying a product but they never replied. And I actually then contacted the national marketing manager as a matter of interest, just first and said, like, I posted this comment, what happened? And what I learned was a long, sad story that they had outsourced the building of their website to rebuild it to a company and the company had not delivered on time and the website wasn't working. And, and it was such a journey of discovery where I was, re I was learning the practical reality of how organizations listen or don't listen. And, and I welcome you to critique that methodology, but uh, it really caused me to think hard about doing these interviews, analyzing documents. And the reason I did multiple interviews is because of this delegation thing that I found I really had to talk to social and market research people because they were often doing a lot of listening, going out, you know, conducting focus group surveys. I had to talk to customer relations or customer service or CRM, whatever it was called, uh, because they were dealing with customers. Many of the government bodies I talked to did public consultation. So I talked to the heads of public consultation. I did interview their heads of PR or corporate communication, sometimes called strategic communication. Uh, I wanted to know about internal communication. So I interviewed the heads of HR or organizational communication. They had social media teams and some of the large corporations and governments also had teams in charge of correspondence uh, or complaints. And so what I was trying to do is not just pick one function, but to try to look at all of the sites of potential listening. Where, where were this organization? And that's why I ended up doing six, six, five, six, seven interviews in many of these organizations. Um, just a little pause then is to quickly though, uh, again, to go back to the literature for, for, for a moment, I realized I had to define what I meant by listening. Because you know, what is listening? Um, does listening mean you have to agree with somebody? And what I was realizing that if we expect too much of listening, of course, it's going to fail. On the other hand, if we expect too little, it can be very much tokenistic. So what is a reasonable understanding of listening? And here I had to do again, go to the literature. And I went to a number of areas of literature, um, particularly in areas like ethics and so forth. And one of the key phrases, basically, I call them the seven canons of listening, because what I found is coming out of the work of Axel Honneth and Charles Husband and, and many of other writers, and this is going well outside of public relations and communication literature into areas like ethics and uh, political science, but recognition of others as having a right to speak versus selective listening. So what I found in a lot of organizations, they said, oh, yes, we listen. Well, who do you listen to? Oh, we listen to our board of directors or we listen to the, the major unions. Um, but often they were not listening and sometimes deliberately not listening. You'd say, well, do you listen to uh, the activist group um, in, in this community? And uh, someone uh, mentioned activist who was, uh, I think it was Shima who mentioned uh, activist studies when we were talking. Um, they would say, oh, no, we don't talk to them. They're, they're ratbags. And I literally had people, organizations say this to me. And I thought, OK, Charles Husband's right. You've got to recognize that humans have a right to speak and you should give them that recognition. Another thing that came up very strongly is the importance of acknowledgement. Uh, and it's in the literature. Um, and a couple of years before, I had the fortune to interview the, the guys who ran the Obama, the first Obama campaign. And what they said is the most important thing you can ever do is acknowledge people. Disagreeing didn't matter, they said. It's just acknowledging. And they, were, they had an automated system for Obama where everybody, as some of you might know, some of you in the States, you got, an, you got a text message or an email saying, thank you for your inquiry. And we all knew it didn't come from Obama. It was written by a machine, probably. But the fact is, it told us that that system had received our message. It wasn't just being 
put in a trash can. Um, and there's also some academic literature that talks again about the importance of acknowledgement. And then, of course, there's some obvious ones. Listening, you need to pay attention. If you don't give any attention to what is being said to you, that's quite rude. You do have to interpret, we found, is that a lot of people are not so articulate. Um, they can't express themselves clearly. So there's an interpretation role in order to lead to trying to understand others. And then the other vital one, of course, is giving consideration to what others say. Finally, uh, the seventh canon was response. And I use the words of some appropriate type because the question kept coming up, well, do you have to agree with people if you are listening to them? Do you have to do what they're asking you to do? And what is interesting in the literature is, and I looked at a lot of literature, nowhere, nowhere was there anything that said that people expected agreement or that agreement uh, had to be part of listening. What you did have to do is re recognize, acknowledge, pay attention to it, try to understand what they were saying, give it consideration, and then respond in an appropriate way. And the appropriate way could be to say, we can't do that for the following reasons. And uh, so I thought the seven canons are, were a very important issue because very often management fears listening. Management frightened to listen because they think we're going to get asked things we can't do. And, and it was really interesting. So I leave you with those, those thoughts. And I finally did then write a definition in a, in a 2019 piece I wrote for the International Journal of Communication uh, that, summed, that tried to incorporate those seven canons. And it just says, I'll quickly read it, organizational listening involves the creation and implementation of, of scaled processes and systems. So scale, depending on the size of your organization and your stakeholders, that enable decision makers and policy makers to actively and effectively access, acknowledge, understand, consider, and appropriately respond to those who wish to communicate with the organization or with whom the organization wishes to communicate interpersonally or through delegated mediated means. And it sounds a bit long and wordy, but what I was pointing out there that we're not dismissing interpersonal. Sometimes you can sit down and talk one-on-one, -on -one, go, to, go to a meeting, but also we do need to recognize that there's a lot of delegated, mediated uh, approaches. Um, now, Michael, I want to go on and talk about three stages. I'll just mention them and then we might just pause and have any questions because I did the project in the end in three stages. So the first one was a two-year study where I spent time with 36 uh, organizations, a mixture of corporate and government. Uh, they were in the US, the UK and Australia. Uh, and that involved 104 interviews, a lot of observation, about five, five months on the ground inside these organizations and content analysis of over 400 documents. The second part of it is uh, I then, after doing stage one, I had the opportunity to work inside the UK government in 2016. So I spent six months full time actually working in the UK government, and I'll come on and talk about that. And then because I'd done so much government, I decided I needed to look at a, corp at a corporate environment in more detail. And I ended up doing a project with three subsidiaries of a, of a large European multinational. Um, perhaps I'll just quickly give you the findings of stage one. So remember, there's three stages, and I'll pause at the end of stage one, and we can just talk about any questions you've got on that. Um, before I go on to talk about stages two. So this was the basic findings of the first two years. What I found is that 80% of organizations communication on average was speaking. And I'm using the word speaking in, uh, in single quotes because we're talking here about advertising, press releases, media releases, speeches, websites, tweeting, posting, brochures, you know, you know I mean, all the things we produce as part of public relations and other areas. Now that 80%, um, you, would, you could quickly ask a question, hang on, this is qualitative research, so how did I get that number? One of the things I, uh, at the end of all interviews, I asked the participants in the interviews, uh, what was their estimate that having, having talked about all the things they do, on average, what percentage of their work did they believe was distributing information versus bringing in information? And this is the figure they gave me. So this is uh, an agreement. Some, in fact, went as high as 95%. Um, and confidentially, I, I, 
most of the organizations are de-identified. This one was happy to be named. This is uh, actually Jaguar Land Rover at Coventry in the UK. And the head of marketing and communication said, straight out, he said, I'd have to say that overall, 95% of everything we do in communication is putting out information. And so that's where the number comes from. It wasn't a quantitative calculation. It was these organizations acknowledging that they, their role, even when it was called communication or engagement or consultation or customer relations, it was about distributing information. Blah, 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 as my slide said. The, the other key thing I found is, of course, there was some listening, but I found that when there was listening, it was mostly instrumental and very organization centric. So, you know, one of the limitations of organizations research is they ask the questions that they want to ask. They don't ask people what they want to talk about. There's a set of, and usually there's the one token open-ended question in most surveys. And as I mentioned before, mostly it was to gain intelligence. It was all about, we need to target people. So we, we want to understand more about them. I also found in stage one that social media very, very worryingly at that time was primarily used for the organization posting messages. Um, that did change later, uh, but at that time, this is uh, 2015, uh, there was very little uh, monitoring for listening what other people were saying in social media. From that um, stage one, I then started to develop a theory uh, and this is open for you to think about. And as well as coming up with seven canons of listening, uh, I wanted to say, what does all that mean? What do you need? Um, and I'll blow that up to make it look a bit bigger. You might be able to see it more clearly. What I found is that, uh, yes, you do need people and technologies and tools to, to listen at an organizational level. But I went back through all the data and I had found an interesting finding from the data. And one was that the organizations with the best technologies and the best systems and the biggest budgets were not necessarily the best at listening. The best, at, often they were organizations with less technology and less people, but what they did have in common, the characteristic that stood out was their culture. And so this was from sort of a meta analysis of all the data I'd collected. And so this was quite a body of data over two years. And so I developed this idea that you need to first at the foundation of organizational listening, you need to have a culture that the organization actually believes that they should be open and listen to people and that it could be beneficial to listen to people. Um, and a number of people, uh, I borrowed this, I didn't really learn this, but um, um, uh, Leah Bassel wrote a book on the politics of listening uh, and a few others have written about this and I thought this was important because I also saw a number of organizations that really uh, were selectively listening. They openly said there were certain people they would not listen to. They weren't interested in listening to some people and they privileged others. So the second thing I recognized is that, that, that you need to avoid the politics of listening. You need to be uh, open to, to various groups. Uh, and then the other things were fairly straightforward. Of course, they need policies. They need to not have a policy to say the role of communication is putting out information. The role of communication should be putting out information and listening to people and bringing in information to the organization. And then you need do, you do need systems and technologies and resources and skills for listening. Um, there's, there's the technologies for listening are different to the technologies of uh, distributing information. The skills of listening are different. Uh, and I will talk about some of the details of these when we get on to stage two. Yeah. And then the final yeah. thing is articulating yeah. what you learn to senior management. Not to throw you off there, Jim, but I just, when you have a chance, two questions, Anne and uh, Mitchell have questions. Okay, yeah, well, I'm gonna, that's exactly where I wanted to stop. So, uh, because we're gonna go on to stage two, so um, Mitchell, Anne, who, want, who wants to go first? Okay, <laughs> um, just a very quick question, but I suspect it won't be a quick answer, Jim. Um, I'm really interested in what you're saying here about the listening. I was particularly interested in, in one of your, your seven canons, which was about the acknowledgement side of things. I haven't yet heard, it might be something you come to later about a distinction between listening and hearing. Um, and the fact that, you know, the acknowledgement side of things might 
result from organizations, people who have heard something and push a button or the AI does it or whatever. Yes, I've heard you, thank you very much. And that becomes tokenistic. And that sort of feeds into what we know about dialogue as well and that, that possibility for tokenism there. Is there an important distinction to be made here between that, yes, I hear you, and yes, I'm listening? Yeah, great. Thanks for asking that, Anne. And um, I'm skipping over a lot of um, stuff today to try and sort of get to the key points. In, in, the, in the book I wrote, and in fact, in some of the journal articles I've written, I've actually put a section on listening versus hearing. Um, and I've actually defined the two because hearing, uh, we know in the case of human biology, it is nothing more than a signal, uh, a sound wave hitting the eardrum uh, in the human ear. And then it travels down the ear canal, it has a magnification. And the very simple analogy I've used is that the hearing is the signal hitting the eardrum, but the listening is what the brain does with the signal. And in the case of the organization, the hearing is the receipt of a piece of correspondence, a complaint, a message. It's the listening is what the organization does with that information. And the seven canons, that's why they have to be used together, that uh, the acknowledgement is an acknowledgement. Yes, we have received uh, your email. Thanks, Anne. But that has to then be followed by paying attention. So that, and it's, isn't it funny how we use the word paying? We use that participle paying attention. It, we actually know there's an investment required. And so this, please read the seven canons as as complementary, they need to all come together. You can't just acknowledge and say, thanks a lot and do no more. You then have to pay attention. You then have to give it consideration. And finally, you do have to respond in an appropriate way, even if it's to say, look, we've heard what you had to say, but I'm um, sorry, we, we, we can't do that. It's not within our budget or, or whatever reason. So it's a very, very good point. Listening is absolutely much, much more than hearing. Perfect. It's exactly what I wanted to hear, and, and I've been listening carefully. Mitchell. Mitchell. Uh, yeah, Jim, you started to answer my question when you started to focus on workplace culture, because my, my, my question initially was, what's the difference between listening versus monitoring versus surveillance versus espionage? And into my mind, it sort of creates a continuum. It's more than just about semantics. It's about an organisation and its willingness to accommodate uh, as a result of that sort of conversation, that listening. Uh, and so to me, it's sort of just sort of, I was mapping it in my mind. To... Sorry. I've lost your sound, Mitchell, in the last little bit. My I, bad. I, I, got, I went too long, did I, Michael? You muted no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That happens. Feel free to mute me if I start. Going. I was trying to put your hand down and then I muted you out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that as my cue to, to stop no, no. talking, but I just sort of no. see it as, I wonder if listening would apply to those grand strategies that Bhutan lays out that are open to accommodation and to cooperation and collaborative decision-making where surveillance or monitoring would more be relevant to those industries that have a grand strategy that's about, you know, not accommodating, resisting, fighting, et cetera. Would, would, you, would you agree with that? Do you feel yeah. your concepts maps to that? Yeah, they do map to that um, very much so. I saw that in the, in the chat too. Uh, thanks, Mitchell. Um, and of course, even with the, I, I end up naming this pyramid, the architecture of listening, or I didn't draw it as a pyramid initially, but uh, because like, like the built environment, um, an architecture is different to design. Um, you and I will design our own house, or our own living room uh, to suit our own purposes, but there is an architecture, which is a broader framework. You know, there are federation architectures, there's modern architectures. So I was using the word architecture for two reasons. One to say that this is not a one size fits all. It, it is a, a set of rules and principles within which you design uh, a listening system for your own organization, but also these principles fit together. So culture, uh, yes, it begins with culture, but culture has to travel all the way through because the culture falls apart if you got a got the got politics of listening and you're only listening to certain people. Culture falls apart if you're not prepared to accommodate. If you're not prepared to, uh, you know, that comes up in a lot in a lot of the literature. You may not be able to do exactly what the stakeholders are asking, but you may be able to accommodate some elements. You might be able to meet them in the middle. Um, so it does link. And same with strategy, because 
you know, in modern strategy work, and uh, uh, I know Paul was talking about studying strategy. Uh, strategy in the past has often been talked about. The organization, senior management, mostly men used to go off into a smoke-filled room and dream up what they wanted to do in the next 10 years and then just do it. And they implemented it. And, and that's a very top-down approach. And now we talk much more about uh, engaged strategy, emergent strategy, network strategy, participatory strategy. And there's a lot of writers writing on this. And that's where, of course, the organization has to have a view of what it wants to do. But it also then talks to as key stakeholders, it considers the environment and what emerges, in fact, is a strategy that reflects the organization's goals, but it also accommodates a lot of the interests of stakeholders. And that's reflected in things like social purpose, uh, corporate social responsibility, um, where you don't abandon your strategy. We're not talking about abandoning that, but we're talking about so issues like accommodation, issues like emergent strategy, issues like negotiation uh, are, all, are all very, very important. You can't access any of those without listening. The only way you discover, if, if you like, the only way you can discover what what people would expect in accommodation or what people might expect in negotiation is by listening to them in an open, active, active way. Fascinating. Thanks, Jim. They're all great points. Um, I was going to quickly to go on and, and some of the architecture of listening, uh, it was sort of broadly developed as a theoretical framework. And then in stages two and three of the project, I really, stage two, I took it to government and we really tried to flesh it out. And then in stage three, we actually applied it in a big corporation and evaluated it um, to sort of test the theory. So I was going to go on to there, but is there any other questions or points so far? Pull me up anytime and Michael, please interrupt when there are those key questions because we like to take people along with us. And I am leaving out a lot. I think I've written 11 journal articles and a book and three research reports on this work so far. So it's sort of, there's a lot of stuff in it. So what I happened after stage one, um, I published a book and a number of journal articles. And quite fortuitously, I was contacted by the UK government communication service, um, which is in the cabinet office in London to say, we'd like, uh, you've got a lot of corporates in that first report, we'd like to look specifically at government and their view, and again here the methodology shifted, and, and I welcome your thoughts on this, because their approach was before I was in a process of discovery. In this case, they said, look, we, we think we're listening, but we'd like to do it better. So how can we improve what we do? And so to me, the appropriate methodology there became participatory action research, because we wanted to identify problems, but we wanted to solve them. And also they wanted to be involved. They had the access. Uh, it was them who were gonna have to do the listening in the end. And so I felt that participatory action research was the appropriate methodology. And then the specific methods we applied um, was again, interviews and content analysis, but a lot of ethnography. So I went to London fully funded um, by the, the government communication service and had the pleasure of living in London for uh, seven months in 2016 in a lovely flat in Bloomsbury. Um, and you know, I'm smiling because it was actually one of the highlights of my life. I, I, I absolutely love this period. And you'll see why in a moment, because initially the government communication service and the cabinet office, uh, Alex Aiken is the director still of that group, and Alex said, well, we've got to focus it. So we'll get you to work with one department in particular, and we'll actually make you a staff member and give you a security pass. And you'll be in the Department of Health. And that was really convenient because in those days, they've moved since, but in those days, the Department of Health was at uh, 79 Whitehall, which is directly opposite the cabinet office, which is 70 Whitehall. And that sounded good, except something happened in June 2016, as you all know. So I'd been on the ground just one month uh, working allegedly with one department. And my wife and I woke up one morning, we didn't even bother listening to the news because we just like everybody assumed it the Brexit was going to be a remain vote. All of the polls said remain. So this is was the context of this research because every politician, every newspaper, every poll was saying it will be remain. And so we went to bed confident it's going to be a remain 
David Cameron, the Prime Minister, slept well. We woke up next morning and heard the 6 a.m. BBC news that Britain had voted to leave the EU. And so it was just, it was amazing. I mean, I went in the cabinet office that day and it was just like a tomb. People were in shock, people were wandering around with a wild stare in their eyes. No one knew what happened. How could this possibly occur? And as many of you know, David Cameron, the prime minister resigned and 13 ministers went in one week. So there was a little bit of chaos. Theresa May assumed the prime ministership uh, within the week and then came and gave a speech to the cabinet office. And little me was sitting way down the back of the room as an observer. But in it, she said, clearly, we've not been listening to the British people. And those words were very fortuitous because 150 heads turned around looking at me and said, we've got a listening project going on about, about listening. And suddenly I was working with 17 government departments, I had an open access to anything in the UK government. Um, and when I mean, you talk about the, and I'm not claiming credit, it was luck, I was in the right place at the right time during a major crisis. I'm just going to quickly summarize. So this was seven months where I went all over. The, the, I had access to all documents, uh, worked with all the departments, but I went to, went to Scotland, I went to Wales, I traveled. I also had freedom to do some of my own research because it was they were funding part of it, but it was still had a high level of independence. So I did things like go to major NHS hospitals and meet with the CEOs and the, and the managers that I didn't have to get approval from the cabinet office so I could do my own thing. And uh, I forgot how many interviews I did in this. This, this project has got well over 320 interviews uh, in it. So it was sort of big. Um, here I'll just summarize some good and bad. What I found is that, so, sorry, social, jump too far ahead. Social media was changing. Um, now I've got videos overlaying my stuff, so I can't see all of my slides. Hopefully you can see the right hand side of the screen where I've got ticks and crosses. Uh, if you can't move your videos, um, social media was changing. Uh, they called it digital insights. And there was quite a bit of social listening starting, still not as good as it could be. So I sort of said that was 50-50. But what I did find disappointing was, and this is common uh, in corporations, but within the government, I found that the whole focus was on campaigns. So everything was built around campaign. And of course, a campaign is what the organization wants to say when it wants to say it. Um, and this has continued because I was a little bit, I, I welcome your thought on this, but I was a bit horrified that in 2019, the UK government declared it the year of marketing. That's the government. Yeah, after all the problems of Brexit and after all the problems of not listening, they declared it the year of marketing. Um, so I don't know, leave it to you, but I thought that's not the way to go. Communication with the British people as a government surely is about engaging and listening and consulting as well as campaign. Of course, we need campaigns. I'm not saying we don't need persuasion. Um, persuasion uh, and information are key parts of communication, but they're not the total picture. Research, research was, so how did Brexit happen? Well, what I found is this research they were doing was almost all quantitative. It was all polling and it was polling of very small samples. Most of it was uh, quota sampling. And so they were, actually not getting uh, you know the people who were angry and I went to Scotland and I thought I was going to be run out of the state or the province or whatever it's called people were so angry in Scotland they all voted to leave but in the polls there was something like six Scots in one of the polls of 200 and so very very small levels of, of, of quota sampling um, and they it was just not a good effective listening and there was practically no in-depth qualitative research. The one that shocked me most of all, uh, and this is to me a story that sticks in my mind, is government, of course, it's mandated that governments have to do consultation in many countries uh, on major policy issues. And the UK government do a lot. In 2016, they did 57 major public consultations. Um, what I found about the consultations was a number of things. They mainly attract the usual suspects. So typically they would announce a public consultation, put it on the website, uh, and the, the submissions would mostly come from, as you'd expect, 
the major organizations, the big lobby groups, the people who could afford the PR firms and the, and the lobbyists and the lawyers. There was no outreach at all. Um, and who was it mentioned diversity? Uh, I think it was uh, Nika. I can't pronounce it. Nika Logan, I think, mentioned diversity. Marginalized groups, diversified groups. Um, nobody was going out to some of the parts of the UK like Wales, where there was very, very disadvantaged groups and actually engaging and talking to those groups. And so I really formed a view that outreach is critical if you want to do real, genuine public consultation and you could apply this to engagement. There was no acknowledgement of submissions, real basic 101 error. So when you wrote a submission to one of these consultations, you didn't even get an email that said, uh, thank you very much. But the really big ones was there was no analysis of the submissions that were coming, no systematic analysis and no reporting back. Let me give you an example. And this was just one that I discovered and it really shocked me. Um, I discovered I was there in 2016, but the year before the National Health Service, and most of you would know that the NHS in England's a, a very big and much loved institution. Um, each two years, it does a huge public consultation uh, to find out what people think and what they see the priorities as. The consultation from the prior year had been done and it had received 127,400 submissions. I'm not kidding, 127,400. Now, there's a couple of issues here. And as communicators, I'm sure you'd pick this up. The prior years, they had averaged 3,000 submissions. Now, how, how smart do you have to be to think, hang on, we normally get 3,000. Gee, this year we got 127,400. Wouldn't you think something's going on? Yeah, this was happening just right before they called the poll for Brexit. So they were ignoring, they were ignoring something, but that many of those submissions were eight, 10, 12 pages. So they came from patients, they came from families, but also many came from health workers, senior doctors and senior, senior nurses who'd been in the health system for many years. But because they had over a million pages, if you had, if they didn't print it out, but if you had, it was a million pages, they had no text analysis software and no training and no skills. And the minister demanded a report within four weeks. So they read a couple and they sent the minister a short report. I can see Anne laughing. I mean, it's tragic, isn't it? I mean, people had taken the time to write all these submissions and nobody did anything with it. Now, I was really keen and here, I'm not blaming the civil servants because what I found is that the minister had put an unrealistic demand on it. The, the department had no software like text analysis tools uh, to do it, no time to do it. Um, and they just simply weren't able to process that amount of unstructured data, because here we're talking about unstructured textual data. Um, so again, methodologically, I, I had a budget for my time to be there, but I had no, no expense budget to spend money. But fortunately, I found that, and I didn't want to use Invivo or something, uh, I didn't, um, it was an academic program. So I thought, I'll use a UK product, and it so happened that the University of Sussex where I knew some people were working with Demos to develop a quite sophisticated machine learning textual analysis program called Method 52. So I contacted them and they were very keen, as you might imagine, to demonstrate their product to the government. So I put a proposition to them that they might use the NHS consultation as a demonstration. And they came in and trained up a series of staff in the Department of Health and we analyzed the 127,400 submissions. We discovered huge, huge major findings, seven in particular. Had they, have known, had they had known those, they would never have called the referendum. And just to give one example is that within the NHS, uh, the, the public saw a lot of problems, uh, lack, of, uh, lack of budget, uh, long waiting times, all of these things. The major, the number one reason that the public thought those problems occurred was because of European citizens coming in under the EU protection and using the NHS for free services. Now, that actually was untrue. Um, 
a few cases had got through where uh, women had come from Eastern Europe and had a maternity and not paid not paid for it and got it free because uh, the Daily Mail wrote a story on it. But actually, most people paid and the NHS was actually making money from medical tourism, as they called it. But the media had reported wrongly, public opinion had that view. And if you'd known that the public was mainly blaming EU for the collapse of the National Health Service in the UK, you might have hesitated, I think, in calling the referendum, wouldn't you? And that's just one example where that lack of understanding, lack of listening, and yet it wasn't, it took us four weeks, by the way, to do the analysis uh, and to get that information. So I just thought it was a great case study. Um, I'm gonna go on and quickly talk about applying that in a corporate environment. But any, any, any questions or comments on in relation to um, stage two, working with the government? It was a very, very hard working. I don't think I had a day off, but boy, it was a fun year. Anybody want to jump in with a question? Uh, I have a question. Sorry, I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm not sure who was first. Why don't you go, go first and then... Uh, Shima, uh, I think. Oh, no. Well, I think they came out close to the same. Right, Shima goes first, please. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, here, um, the assumption is that uh, the, the organization has a lot of resources and wants to improve listening. What if the organization does not have enough resources and justify their politics of listening and how they're prioritizing some stakeholders over others because they they have limited resources and they have to um, ignore some voices. Yeah, I look. I think it's. I, I totally accept that you're correct. There'll be some organisations will have a lot of resources, and the UK government certainly had a lot of resources. Mind you, they were in the process of reducing them under a previous government. They were spending. Uh, 900 and something billion dollars on communication massive today they spend about 400 um, billion dollars on community of all types a lot of it is paid media advertising um, but to me it depends on how you look at communication and and that was why I sort of started with some really basics if you look at what communication is what engagement is to me, it's whatever level of budget and whatever size organization, your communication, your engagement, your, your work that you're doing, your corporate communication, whatever you're calling it, it has to be a mixture of informing, persuading, and as well as listening. Uh, it has to be a combination. Uh, and I think the, the problem, our, our, our professional industry, the industry we all work for and with uh, has, is that we've come to interpret communication as distributing information, uh, persuasion and information, and only apply to a very small part, you know, five to 10% of resources and budget gets applied to listening. I don't think that, and I'm not suggesting you would turn around and apply 80% of your budget or 70% to listening, that would be unrealistic. But there's something wrong when the proportion is 80 to 95% on distributing information and only as little as 5% spent on, on listening, given that listening, um, and I'll just recite a line that I wrote in, in, in some of my articles that I really believe in, and, and I think this is an important line. I've said it to CEOs in meetings and they all stopped and stared at me for a while until I understood it. Listening is a communicative, communicative act in itself. Now they see listening and most people see listening as, oh, it's a pause in communication while you gather data. Now, listening to someone is a communicative act. The converse is not listening to somebody is a communicative act. When you're listening to someone, you are saying something to them. You're saying, I care, I want to hear from you. When you're, you think about it in your personal life, if you, someone is not listening to you, they are communicating something to you. They are saying, we don't care. We don't care what you've got to say. And I think that's really important that we've come to somehow think of communication as the putting out of stuff. Uh, Alex Aiken at the uh, UK Government Communication Service calls it SOS, sending out stuff is how it does. And he said, in many cases in government, it's sending out another four letter word starting with S, <laughs> which is quite humorous on Alex's part. Whereas communication um, is certainly got to involve informing 
we have to inform stakeholders, customers. We have to persuade people occasionally. Look at COVID. We have to persuade people to act healthily during COVID. Um, but also we have to understand uh, if you take the case of COVID right now, I'm doing listening work in relation to called communities because the government's trying to persuade them what they need to do in relation to COVID. But what we found is they were using methods they decided they didn't go and listen to some of those communities to find out where they get information from, who do they trust? Turns out they don't trust government officials, they trust their own local doctors and their own local communities. So by listening, we learned that we had to distribute the information in a different way. It was no point doing an advertising campaign or having the minister on TV. Those particular communities, communities did not trust or listen to those people. And, and I think so, I think it's proportional is what, I, what, I'm, what I'm arguing. And I would never propose that you drop everything else and start listening. Um, but a life without listening is not a life uh, that's, that's well lived. Okay. Okay, so uh, I did the third stage of the project for three or a couple of reasons. Um, the first, we, had, we, we had one more question, though. I think. Oh, uh, sorry. Yep. Let's go. Who was that? Um, yeah, uh, yeah. My question is, um, how would you, how do you think of um, government listening from an ethical perspective? Would you think listening um, as a means of ethical government public relations or the end of government? Uh, ethical, sorry, ethical government public relations. Yeah, yeah it's, a, um, it's a very important question. And, and I am going to come, um, I'll probably answer this more fully towards the end because I put some provisos on listening uh, because um, when you get into using advanced systems and technologies, particularly as you move up my, uh, my architecture and you start to apply some of the advanced technologies, for example, um, then you really must do it within an ethical framework. So we all know the story of Cambridge Analytica uh, and Facebook, and they were listening. That's not the kind of listening I'm talking about. Um, and so I, I suppose the simple answer to your question is that all of the work we do in communication has to be done in an ethical way. And therefore, the way we would do listening um, would also have to be done. We should not be listening to private information. We should not be listening to personal information that we can use to exploit people um, because those are unethical practices. We have to, we, so we have to follow the laws of privacy. Um, and we also, in a corporate responsibility way, have to look at mutual benefit. Is there mutual benefit? Um, and so there's a whole lot of both legal and ethical issues that surround it. And I will come back to that in the end, because some of the advanced technologies we're getting, whether they are machine learning software, uh, chatbots, et cetera, um, can actually listen to people and can listen to information that we should not be listening to or we should not be using in certain ways. Um, so uh, if, you, if you don't mind, I will come back to that. It is a very important point, though. The reason I did stage three of the listening project, a couple of reasons. Um, I, I, most of my research in my career has been about evaluation. So one of the, the questions that kept coming up um, quite legitimately was, well, OK, Jim, that's good what you say. Listening is important, but it's going to cost us a lot of money to listen. And, and, and how is it going to contribute to the bottom line? And of course, this was coming from uh, corporations. Um, government knows that they should listen because democracy itself uh, is about the voice of the people. So there is an ethical argument that a government that does not listen is actually fundamentally acting unethically because that's what democracy is about, the voice of the people. Um, the other issue is, though, uh, again, out of practical reasons, I was contacted after finishing the UK work and publishing quite a bit. I was contacted out of the blue by a corporation called ACMEA. And I'll be honest, I'd never heard of them. Um, it's a European company. Um, it's a multinational mutual corporation and mutual meaning they're nonprofit. They're in the insurance and finance market and they originated in the Netherlands um, out of um, the way many of the uh, early um, sort of self-help group right from Amish communities where uh, yeah, you've heard, seen the story in the movies, if someone's barn burns down, all the other farmers get together and rebuild the barn. 
and then when and they and they reciprocate. And so this began over 200 years ago and, and grew to become a very large corporation and they maintain their members as the as the the trust uh, the owners of the corporation. But they're quite large. They they now own, for example, even though the holding company is not known in the Netherlands, Zilver and Chris is the largest uh, uh, health insurance company in the Netherlands. It's the main company. Inter-American is a very large uh, company, insurance company in Greece. Union Postovna is an insurance company in Slovakia. So these are some of their subsidiaries and they have one in Australia. Akmea asked me would I address a CEO summit uh, that happened to be in Istanbul. Um, and their question was, uh, we're a mutual corporation. We should listen to our, our members. Uh, we'd like to do it better, but we want to know what it costs and how do we do it and what's the benefit? Will it will it cost us a lot of money? Will it bring in any benefits? So I thought this is a great evaluation project and it's a great way because to convince a corporation to listen better, uh, they very often want to know what's the bottom line, what's in it for them. So we did three stages with this project in 2018, 2019. The first one, um, we reviewed all of their existing li listening activities. Uh, and I wrote a research report. So I literally spent time in ACME in the Netherlands, uh, Zilvan Chris, uh, Inter-American in Greece, Union Postovna. And I have to say, I had to spend uh, a month in Union Postovna in Slovakia in the middle of winter in January. Uh, so it was a very, very cold period. Um, but I spent, again, using ethnography, interviewing, uh, looking at every way they possibly listened and wrote a research report. And then the agreement was that from Q2 2018 into 2019, the company would look at implementing a number of those initiatives that we could identify as ways of improving listening. And then the third stage, very importantly, in the uh, second and third quarter, July through to about October 2019, we went back and I did an evaluation of the results. Uh, just a bit of quick background, they have 10 million customers, so we're talking a fairly large organization, 14 and a half thousand employees, and they sell mostly through agents and brokers, so they have a distribution channel of 250 independent agents and brokers, so those were their key stakeholders, 10 million customers, 14 and a half thousand staff, and these 250 business partners. Um, again, I had to recognize that listening doesn't occur in any one place. We identified in preliminary planning that the main ways that they were listening or potentially listening was through, of course, customer relations came up very high. They had a lot of money spent on CRM to measure customer satisfaction. Uh, they owned three call centers handling inquiries. Um, uh, over a million phone calls a year, for example. We're talking big numbers here. They conducted quite a bit of research. They had a marketing communication department with a lot of advertising. The sales channel was mostly the brokers. They had a large internal HR department. They had a PR corporate comms department. And of course, they had websites and social media. So these were the main areas we looked at. Now, I'll just we don't want to go on too long and I want to allow more time for discussion. So I'll just in this table, summarize a couple of the key things we did. Um, and on the left hand side, I've just listened, listed some of the methods. Um, and then I've put in what they what they already had, what was existing, and what tool they used, where we expanded it and what we did new. Um, so like many companies, and many of you would have heard of Net Promoter Score, they already did NPS surveys. Uh, with a company called Metrics Lab in Rotterdam. But what I discovered very quickly is even though they did that, they were mainly, mainly collecting the score on a zero to 10 scale. Um, they weren't asking any open-ended questions. So if you said you had a problem with the company, you were a detractor, you didn't know why. So the first thing we did is we expanded the NPS surveys by adding in uh, up to three open-end questions to ask them why they felt the way they did, what they thought the company could do better to help them. They did a huge amount of statistical analysis. That wouldn't surprise you uh, because they were a finance insurance company. So that was existing. They used SAS analytics. But the, like the UK government, they didn't use any text analysis at all. And this is one of the biggest findings of all of my research is that when you think about the voice of customers, the voice of people, the voice of stakeholders, people don't speak in numbers, people speak in words. 
So most of the feedback we get is words and therefore we need to be good at text analysis. But none of the companies that I work with actually had text analysis or content analysis tools uh, other than applied to say media content. And so we then took the modules, the extra modules we subscribed uh, to from SAS and put in text analysis. Um, and this company was very cooperative. So I was paid to do the research and all my costs were funded, but also they had ancillary costs. So for example, they had to hire two text analysts. So we had two full-time text analysts uh, came, were brought onto the staff in their intelligence team. The other thing we, I mentioned the top of my architecture of listening that articulation to management's important. And what we found, um, found this to some extent in the UK, but I found it here, is that the top level management of this company had very little time, very, very busy. And if they got long written reports, they never read them. We had to visualize, and some of you would know this. So again, another new thing we did is we brought in Microsoft Power BI and all of the text analysis and that the, the statistical analysis was already visualized, but we started to do visualization. And I'll show you a sample in a moment uh, of all the text analysis work to, to present it to management in a way that they could see it. They did have automatic website user feedback. They used a product called Usability that seemed to work fine. So we left that. They were not doing any customer journey mapping. They were doing lots of customer satisfaction surveys. But the problem with customer satisfaction surveys, again, they are a survey and they capture a moment in time. And it might be a moment when the customer is happy or unhappy. What customer journey mapping does, does, journey mapping does, as some of you may know, is that it actually tracks customers over the whole period from when they first hear about the company to when they maybe buy the product to after they buy the product to when they get a, a complaint or a service call and you average out the customer experience. So we brought in um, Reframer is a product. One of the subsidiaries used Reframer, another one used a consultancy. Uh, and that was another innovation. They did do employee satisfaction surveys. So we left those in place. And they did, of course, do media monitoring for both traditional and social uh, through a company. Um, and we did expand that somewhat. They were doing very, very quantitative work. And we wanted to see a lot more about messages and, and what people were saying. And we wanted to use social media, not just to track their messages, but to track what other people were saying about them. And so I'll just take one example, uh, and this, is, this has been written up in a couple of management journals as well as communication journals. The NPS surveys, as I said, the first thing we did, uh, we added some open-ended questions. So they were getting the score of zero to 10. I think most of you would be familiar with NPS. Um, nine, and 10, you, uh, nine and 10 rating means you're a promoter, you're a real advocate or a fan. Uh, zero to seven, I think it is, is uh, zero to six, you're a detractor, you're unhappy. And in the middle, you are, you are a passive. So we added some open-ended questions that if people were happy, we wanted to know why, what was the main things making them happy? And if they were not happy, what were the main things that were bugging them? We then, with the text analysis software, we had two text analysts on staff and we introduced text analysis of all of this data. Now, bear in mind, they've got 10 million customers we're getting a million phone calls a year. So we're starting to collect quite a bit of data. The third thing we did um, hasn't been done very often is we introduced what um, we end up calling a closed loop methodology. And that is we trained up a special team. They have a call center and they had well over a thousand uh, staff in the call center in uh, Greece, for example, in Athens. That's a big call center. And we trained up a special team uh, in difficult conversations because detractors, unhappy customers can be quite rude and aggressive. So we gave them special training and their job was to do outbound calls to detractors. So we picked the most unhappy customers and their job all the time was to call them to see whether they could help those people. Now, don't try and read this chart because it is in Greek, literally unless you can read Greek. But this was just one example of what we showed to management in the visualization. So we're able to, through the text analysis, go back to management and in red are the detractors, the unhappy customers, and the text alongside it is a brief description of what they're unhappy about. The yellow or the orange are the passives 
and the right hand side, the green, are the promoters, the very happy customers. And again, what are they mostly happy about? Now, what we're then able to do by that visualization, we also had the number of times people had complained about or praised something. So we said, what we're going to do is we'll take at least the top 10 reasons that people are unhappy and we will call all of those people. And well, well first of all, at least we know what they're unhappy about and we know what they are happy about. So one of the key messages to management was see all those things in green, make sure you keep doing them see all those things in red, stop doing them. And literally it was that I said that in the boardroom, it was as simple as that. And management could get it. They were like, wow, okay, that's all the good stuff. Okay, let's call in all the directors and all the ops managers. These are the things we're, we're liked for, let's keep doing them. And okay, we need to address all those leading things in red. Yeah, so what did we, um, yes? Mitchell had a question. Go Mitchell. Just, just a boring methodological question. Uh, text analysis, I've heard of textual analysis. Uh, text analysis, just looking at your data there, sort of seems similar to content analysis to me. G can you just unpack a little bit what you mean by text analysis, Jim, and how it might be different to content analysis? Uh, 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 qu content analysis? Yeah, yeah they're, they're all cousins, to be honest. Um, text and in fact, textual analysis and text analysis, I don't know a difference. Um, I think the more technical term is textual analysis, to use an adjective, uh, but it's often called text analysis. Um, it is more detailed than content analysis. So content analysis is used a lot in media uh, and thematic analysis is another very similar term. And so is narrative analysis. They're all degrees of analysis. So keeping it simple with thematic analysis and narrative analysis, you're not getting, you're getting down to larger units of analysis. You're looking more at the overarching themes or the overarching narratives. With textual analysis, we're often trying to get right down to individual words. We're trying to get into real matching keywords that, uh, um, you know, if it, it might be uh, language in a policy. Uh, that was one that came up in the negative, it, the, the word language or terminology. Uh, very specific. They couldn't understand some of the language and the terminology. Um, so there's various texts on it. I hear some some methodological writers argue that there's a difference. I personally don't know of any difference between text or textual analysis, but I do know it's and it's very very similar to content analysis. Content analysis, of course, originated purely as a quantitative method. It has evolved into being quantitative and qualitative by applying uh, methods from textual analysis. And so they kind of all interrelate. Some of you um, may even be able to explain it better, but that's my my understanding of the, okay. of the methodology. Thank you for that. I just want to make sure I was using the right methodology in my own yeah. research. And I, <laughs> thanks, Jim. A couple of exciting results, and we're getting close to the when I'll shut up and we'll have more discussion. So after we had as callbacks to detractors at the end of 2019, we found that after the callbacks from these trained team, 21.5% converted from being detractors to being passive. So we were fairly happy with that. It meant that you know nearly a quarter or a fifth uh, were at least neutral. Kind of expected that. Um, 29.9, 30% remained attractors. So we failed to move the needle with a third, but this was the interesting one. 48.6% converted, not just to being passive, they converted from being a detractor, an unhappy customer to being a promoter. Now we were quite stunned by that result. And it does show the importance of acknowledgement and responding to people is that by calling them, many of them, we didn't fix the problem. In many cases, it was uh, the language of the policy is very complex and we can't change it for a few years, but gee, thanks for calling me. But, so this was interesting for nearly half of the people that we contacted became promoters. Now, why is that significant? Well, we know that promoters are highly likely to be retained customers. And we also know that detractors are pretty likely to be lost customers. Not guaranteed, but you do tend, when people are detractors for more than one year, chances are they won't with, be with you a third year. If they are promoters, they are highly likely to renew. Now in the group, and all this data was available from their own finance department, so I didn't work this out. We went to the finance department and said, well, how many detractors do you have? 17,000. So that sounds like a big number, 
but bearing in mind they've got 10 million customers, it's actually only 0.17. So this is actually a pretty good company, but 17,000 detractors is still a lot of unhappy customers. And so then we said, well, okay, if 48.6% of them, if we continue doing this and we can convert 48.6% of all of those 17,000 detractors, which would be 8,262 to promoters, and if they remain customers multiplied by CLV, which is customer lifetime value, again, it's a figure, the company will know what is the average spend, that worked out at over 40 million euro. Now this whole project cost just under 300,000 euro. So we then went conservative and said, okay, we can't assume that they're all gonna stay customers forever. So we then said, let's be conservative. What if only half of those converting from being unhappy to being promoters stay? That still is 24 million euro or 30 million US dollars. And so that was our report back to the board that by doing this and continuing this strategy, we think you're adding about 30 million US dollars to the bottom line. So do you think they were happy? They certainly were. Now that wasn't the only bit of data. We also were able to show in their annual customer satisfaction survey came in that customer satisfaction had increased quite substantially overall in the survey. And particularly 94% of online customers reported being satisfied. That was really important because they were in the middle of a shift to online marketing of a lot of their simple insurance products like travel insurance. They didn't sell it through brokers. They just put it online employee satisfaction and employee retention increased there was so that meant reduced recruitment and training costs and there was even some evidence of higher productivity because they were doing some things with less people and doing them doing them better so overall that was a, a very very interesting study it was written up in corporate communications and a number of management journals um, and that that sort of showed there's there's some really tangible benefits uh, as well as ethical and moral benefits from listening. Um, I just wanted to finish on this because there was a very important question about it. The more you move into listening systems and you start using advanced technologies, um, there's many listening systems. Of course, we have the common research methods like interviews and focus groups and so on. There's a number of advanced research and engagement methods. And I tend to find to listen deeply you do need to get beyond the standard interviews and focus groups and certainly surveys. Even in the interviews, by the way, um, I've put it here as deliberative polling as an advanced method. Um, that's a method that a number of writers are talking about where rather than just sending out a poll, you send out people some information, you ask them to think about something in advance and to, to deliberate on it, and then you do the poll and you tend to get a, a, a better thought through result. I also um, did what I call deliberative interviewing, where in two in the, in the second round of government interviews and in the uh, ACMAIA interviews, I interviewed people in 2018. I went back and interviewed all the same people in 2019, and we asked them about what had changed. But I also asked them some of the same questions, and it was deliberate because I said, you know, you've had time to think about this. 30% of the people that I interviewed said things like. Yeah, I thought about that, you know, but in hindsight, I don't think my answer was quite right. When, the more I think about it, I now think X. And I found that really interesting that when people have time to deliberate, they actually come up with a much more informed and balanced view. Uh, not always better, sometimes it's worse, sometimes they, they, they mull it over and have a worse. But I found that getting into more advanced methods, whether it's deliberative interviewing, deliberative polling, uh, participatory action research, where you deliberately involve them in the project, in finding solutions. Uh, some of the work of Brenda Durvin and others on sense-making methodology, uh, appreciative inquiries, another advanced method. I'm finding some of these more advanced methods uh, are very important. And then, of course, there are technologies. And uh, this was the question asked earlier. Um, definitely, you know, we're now using chatbots that can listen to people. We've all got Siri and Alexa in our home. Isn't it strange, you know, my wife and I were talking about a pizza uh, the other day. Maybe we'd have a pizza and within 10 minutes we had uh, text messages from a local pizza shop uh, popping onto our phones. Oh, my God. So you think, wow, you know, something's oh, happening out there. Um, 
learning algorithms based on natural language processing. These are important, but we do have to recognize that technologies have advantages, they have limitations, and they do have dysfunctions. And we're not alone in this. There's some really good literature coming out. Uh, and I've given all my references are in the back, by the way, if you want them. But Gillespie, Landau, a number of people are writing about uh, the, the risks of digital surveillance or data valence, as it's called. So the sort of listening I'm talking about is not the kind of listening that Cambridge Analytica was doing. It's not the kind of even the marketing literature where it talks about we can listen to people to find out you know, what products they might have so we can target them. One of the horrible things in the UK was um, they were uh, gaining intelligence about people by tracking social media people who had disabilities or a person with a disability in the home. And then they targeted those people with email marketing messages that the government's not doing this for you, that we will do more things to support people with disability. I mean, that's really very exploitive marketing. How do, they were not entitled to have that information. They, that was people's private, private chats. Um, algorithmic filtering, algorithms, there's a lot of literature on algorithms at the moment where um, famous stories of where you purely based on uh, uh, a little quick story, police in Washington, D.C., one of the stories I read and picked up during the study was policemen driving along in Washington, D.C., see a elderly black man driving a very old beat up Chevrolet straight away from the fact of his uh, color, his race and the car he's driving. They put on the sirens and pull him over, get him out of the car, lead him over the bonnet. He is a suspect. It turns out simply, he's actually a medical doctor and he's driving his son's car because his son is not available. And he's simply taking his son's car home and his son owns this old car. But the algorithm that came up on the police computer said likely criminal. And that was based on data. And the problem was the data was found to be well over 15 years old. Even, it was also the suburb he was in was part of the algorithm. And that suburb has now become gentrified, but because he was in that suburb, in that car, and he was black, the algorithm calculated that he was highly likely to be a criminal. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of risks around this that we need to be aware of. Um, and some of the excitement about AI we have to be very, very cautious about. So uh, that that is, in a way, is a, a whole subject in its in its own in its own right. Okay, there, I got three questions, Jim. I think Upesh and Diana were first. I'm not sure which, and then Nika. Okay, uh, I have a question. Uh, the organizations that will exhibit, you know, key features of. Uh, uh, organizational listening, you know, such as acknowledgement, accommodation, and, you know, things that you talked about. How will their approach to communication change? And what kind of impact will this have on their day-to-day -day public relations? Well, um, how, how it will change is that uh, if you think back and you look at my diagram of the architecture of listening, um, when, what I'm, when I'm writing about that, what I'm saying is that in the name of communication, uh, or it could be in the name of corporate communication, public relations, what I'm concluding is that we've actually constructed an architecture of speaking inside organizations. We've primarily built this architecture or created this design and architecture of speaking. What we should be doing is constructing an architecture of speaking and an architecture of listening. So at no point am I saying we will abandon many of the things we do. Uh, it is quite legitimate that we have need campaigns to inform people. Uh, it is quite legitimate to persuade people in many cases. We want to persuade them about road safety. We want to persuade them about health and, and so forth. But um, to me, there is an imbalance in that we've somehow in, uh, interpreted our disciplines and we've created practices that are really are about speaking on behalf of the organization. And I found that in job descriptions, I found it in the interviews, I found it in the outputs of the organization that almost everything, the person, the people who were called communication were mostly putting out information. Now, that's not the definition of communication. Communication, um, going back to Robert Craig, it is speaking and listening. And so to me, it's a matter of 
rebalancing, if you like, uh, and reconceptualizing what we mean by these functions. Um, in some cases, we do acknowledge it. Uh, we talk about engagement, um, but we often engagement when we practice it. Uh, and I see many organizations do this. They, uh, I've got an advertising report in front of me, in fact, on my desk uh, from a New South Wales department, and it says our engagement ratings. And all they talk about is how many people are clicking on their, on their stuff. Now, that's not engagement. Engagement, surely, has got to be two-way. How are they engaging with those people? They're looking at it as and saying, you know, um, what's the definition I wrote down the other day? I wrote down a, see if I can, I'll see if I can find it. It's in my phone. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, when I said here, when we're monitoring and measuring what the what our organization says, its voice is like singing in the shower. It's very flattering, but it tells you nothing about an audience, about the real reality of your vocal abilities or your audience's response. That's just something I was writing at the moment. So to me, you know, it's we don't want to be just singing in the shower saying, wow, it sounds good. Look at all the stuff we're putting out. Look at all that. We are the voice of our organizations. I've actually heard a uh, head of marketing of Microsoft describe communicators as the megaphones of their organization. That was his phrase. Now, how should we change? I don't believe our job is to be the megaphone shouting on behalf of our organization. Surely, if we are relationship builders, we're involved in engagement, we're involved in dialogue, surely we are in a mediating role. Surely we are speaking for the organization, we're helping the organization speak, but we've also got to be bringing in those voices to the organization uh, that, they, that the, they need to listen to, they need to hear, they need to engage with. Um, that would be my belief, and to me, that's ethical communication. Anyone else want to comment on, on, on that thought? There's lots of chat. Yeah, so will that become a continuous process? Like, you know, we are taking in uh, feedback from our, you know, from our customers and, and changing our communication plans and strategies? Uh, I think it is. I, you know, I look back and and I'm an academic who came from practice, like a, a few others on this call. I, I worked. Uh, I started my career as a journalist, um, and in my day, journalists didn't care at all about what people thought. All they wanted to do was ask their own questions and write their own views. Uh, but even working in public relations and marketing communication, um, I actually always thought my job was just to put stuff out. And that's what we did. Uh, and I think it, it, it must change because it depends on your objectives. Um, if, if you see your job as distributing information, then that's what it would remain. But if we really, and that's why I began uh, the talk, uh, talking about uh, where does this fit? If we see our work as engagement, engagement is not just blaring and talking. You know, and uh, I, I often speak to CEOs a lot. And, and I always say to them, I, I, I invite CEOs to an experiment. I say, after today's talk, go home to your family and your friends. And for the next month, just talk. Just keep talking. See how your relationships are. And we all know the answer. Or try it another way. After this, go home to your families, your friends and your colleagues and spend at least half your time listening to people. And they all nervously laugh because they know exactly what happens. You know, we all know the party bore that talks and talks and talks. And after about 20 minutes, everyone's moved away and avoided that person. And so why, why is it any different to organizations? Um, to me, it should be a balance. So in reality, when we are doing things, we will always have research running somewhere in the background. But if we are involved in engagement and public consultation, when we plan it, surely we've got to plan not only how we'll collect the information, but how will we analyze the information? Do we use textual analysis? Do we have the tools? Do we have the skills? And what will we do with the results? Will we take them to management? How will we present them to management? To me, that's the full, the full effect. And that's sort of that architecture of listening. Very often we just say, we've done the, we've done the stakeholder engagement exercise. 
you know, I, I hear the New South Wales government say this. Oh, the minister flew out to Broken Hill and he had a meeting with, with all the groups out there and he flew back and was very happy. But what happened as a result? Who took notes? What did they do with the notes? How were they articulated up to the policymakers? So does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. It's very insightful. Okay, so Diana and then uh, Nika and then Chris. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, the presentation so far. I had a question, but with this sheet up, maybe the answer is already here. Um, because um, you spoke about how to advance the ways to listen and to bring voices into the organization. Um, but I would be interested to know, um, I did a research project at the Dutch government, a two-year uh, participatory uh, project in 2014, 2016, very similar. Um, also for your work at the UK, your reports <laughs> yeah, were really uh, fundamental for that work. Um, but what I wondered, like but when we were researching, we found that if you look for a richer sort of voice and also um, work with more qualitative uh, methods that it's actually harder to convey that back to the policy makers and the decision makers in the organization. So could you say a bit more about the balance between uh, the architectures for listening and also the uh, efforts of finding more voice or richer voice? Yes, the qualitative, and I think that's the reason that a, a lot of people rely on surveys, is that qualitative data, uh, unstructured data, is actually, we all know this, it's much harder to analyze than, you know, it's actually pretty easy to do basic statistical analysis on lots of numbers. Uh, and we do have the um, professional uh, challenge that when you look at uh, demographic studies of management, uh, there's a dominance of people with numerical backgrounds, accountants and finance people and, and so forth. So they understand numbers very well. Um, and I do think it has to be a balance. Uh, I find that you can't listen to people purely using surveys and quantitative methods, simply because people speak in words, people tell their stories. Um, and storytelling is an interesting thing because storytelling is another one of these great buzzwords. But when people use it, often or mostly they are talking about storytelling for the organization, telling the organization stories. What about people telling their stories? You know, the indigenous, the First Nations people living at Charleville or living at, uh, or the, you know, American Indian people or who it is telling their stories about what it is to lie and how are we listening to that story and what are we doing with that story? And so we do have to collect qualitative data because people, people will speak in words, um, they'll write in words, they'll speak verbally in words, they, even if it's a video, they'll still often be speaking. We need to be able to analyze that data, but to me, you can turn that data, and sometimes you've got to back it up. So with the ACMEA example I gave, we did a lot of qualitative work, but we then also backed it up with some quantitative work. We found out what people thought and why, but then we turned it into how many. Um, and that did help with management. So you do have to play the management game um, that if we find out, because yeah, the qual is going to tell us the, the what and the why, but it doesn't tell us how many. So if only, uh, you know, if only 500 customers were unhappy, I don't think ACMEA would have been interested. But when we could show them that 17,000 people were detractors and that we could shift them, half of them, almost half of them to being positive, and that would equate, equate to so many uh, euro or dollar, dollars on the bottom line, they were extremely interesting. So visualization, being able to combine qual and quant, uh, those are, and, and that's why I put skills into the architecture. Um, I found in my own work that the skills I learned as a journalist, when I first came to work in public relations, that was all you needed. You had to be a good writer. They all said, oh, you've got to be able to write. Then you need good media relations. Then maybe you need to be able to make PowerPoint presentations and a few things. And that was it. And yet the skill set that we need today, to me, is very, very different. Um, and we're finding that we've really got it. And that's why I'm, I mentioned some advanced research methods. Uh, I probably use more participatory action research. I recently worked on an, on a project with appreciative inquiry, which I'd never worked on before. Uh, and these were people who, um, many of whom uh, were very aged, people had dementia, and they weren't even able to tell their stories in words very well. 
And so the person uh, coordinating the group had them drawing things, uh, painting, and then looking at the stories they were telling from that. So that was a, uh, a very advanced sort of method, but they were telling their stories through creative acts and painting and drawing. Um, that, that is a legitimate way to do it. We're able to try and capture their feelings and, how, you know, and, and, and analyze that data. So I think we need new tools and we all know there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm about AI worldwide at the moment. Um, I'm worried that we see AI more as a tool to target and market and sell products uh, rather than how we might be able to, and we see algorithms in the same way, or yes, we can support marketing, um, but algorithms uh, can be used in negative ways as well as positive ways. Uh, and we need to be, uh, we need to advance our skills in ethics when our knowledge of ethics, we need to advance our skills, I think in advanced research methods um, certainly, you know, I can tell you analyzing 127,400 submissions to government was a pretty daunting thing. I'm not pretending I cruised through that. I laid awake night after night thinking, how the hell am I going to do this? I had to get on the phone and call people I knew. And it was finally, with the help of colleagues and other academics, they said, oh, talk to Demos, talk to the University of Sussex. And we had the developer come in and well, we need the training. Well, what if we train a couple of you as a pilot study? And we put it together. And along the way, I learned a hell of a lot. So it's, um, you know, many of our universities now talk about lifelong learning. That applies to me, a 70 year old distinguished professor, as it applies to everybody. I'm learning all the time. Okay, um, Nick is next, and and then Chris, and I, and I think maybe we should wrap it up after this because I know Jim's got a, a lot long day ahead of him too. Still, so um, if we could, uh, you know, unless you had a quick question, so let's go ahead and go, Nika, and then Chris. Okay, Jim, thank you so much for just everything you shared. It really got my mind working. So my question was: We always hear all the time about the integration of. PR with marketing, sometimes with advertising and integrated marketing communications. So I was wondering, would there be any benefits to exploring the integration of like PR and customer service or customer relations and how that might enhance organizational listening? Might any innovations come from that? Yes, yeah, a couple of good points you raised there. Um, my personal opinion is I'm very worried and concerned about attempts to sort of either merge marketing and public relations or put public relations under the ambit of marketing. Um, I do accept that marketing PR, PR, some PR work is there to support marketing, that's fine. But public relations, I don't think, I think I'm preaching to the choir here. I think most of you would acknowledge that public relations, if it's practiced to its potential, it is much more than marketing. It's about building relationships uh, between groups and, and it's much more than simply marketing. And marketing, uh, is, is, if it's done ethically, is a perfectly responsible way to promote, in most cases, products and services, but also there is social marketing. Um, the, the second part of that question was, so I keep it away from marketing. I, I think the other areas are interesting because uh, I have written a controversial piece recently in a, in a European journal uh, that I call a macro, some, I named it something like a macro view at, at communication, because we very often claim that public relations is the premier or, a, or an overarching field uh, for an organization's strategic relationships. Um, what you will, you will have seen in what I've just been talking about and what I wrote about was when I looked at all of the real communication and the best engagement and the best consultation um, happening in these organizations, it actually was not coming from the public relations staff or the corporate relations staff uh, or even the digital and social media teams, um, which is a bit disappointing. Um, there was the some of the work at ACMEA was actually coming from specialists in behavioral insights. It was coming from people in customer relations uh, and advanced CRM. I mean, Metrics Lab in, uh, in Rotterdam was a NPS survey company. And they came up with the idea of saying, well, why, why don't we add in these questions? Do you guys have the capability to, to phone the detractors? 
And then I had to go back and talk to management and we said, well, can we borrow, can we take maybe 50 of your call center staff and get them to call detractors? And then they said, oh, HR came in and said, they won't have the skills, they can be difficult. Okay, then HR said, well, why don't we get them training in difficult conversations? And so there was input from HR, input from customer relations. And so when I looked at it, I was, as someone who's worked in public relations, I, I came away disappointed that I was that I thought we could be at the pointy end of this, um, but in fact, some of the most innovative work I'm seeing is coming out of uh, um, many other many other areas. And in areas like the UK government communication service, they won't hire public relations staff. They're actually hiring people with backgrounds and behavioural insights and psychology and different skills. So um, that might sound depressing, but I, it it tells me we've got a big challenge in front of us to make public relations, if we want public relations to be what we normatively say it can be, I think there's a, we've got to lift our game. Thank you so much. Okay, Chris, you wanna wrap us up with your question? Okay, thanks so much. It's very impressive to see your seven canon of the organization reasoning uh, architecture. And while looking through your uh, architecture, I'm thinking about the company named Amazon recently. And in terms of the Amazon, they have one of the toughest some kind of technical AI algorithm and Alexa they have, and they have a very uh, observed, obsessed with consumer services area, and probably they got a top in the score NPS, I believe. But I just wonder what is the outcome of the organization reasoning? For instance, they got some kind of out of the if we measure the organization listening status as an Amazon might be the number one, right? Then is it eventually, we cannot say that there's a number one in reputation, I believe, because you know recently they got us some kind of, on a lot of issues are sorting out and then recently out of 100 of the Fortune 500 probably. So I just wonder, my question is, if the company has a highest score in the organization's reasoning, how can they uh, make sure that uh, some of the corporate managers or leadership, how can they it is and translate into corporate reputation or is the consequence uh, result? Yeah, there's a few. I mean, um, first of all, with Amazon, um, I guess it's one we're all familiar with because we all buy books, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and Amazon has used uh, learning algorithms in a very, very advanced way. What we've discovered, and I, and I must admit I've discovered it, is that their algorithm, because it tracks not only the books I buy, it tracks books that I spend time online looking at. Mm -hmm. It's quite a sophisticated algorithm. It ends up being very, very accurate, and they recommend things to me that I would never have found. Um, and so I kind of like the, the the Amazon one because it seems to have been a. It's a very modern one. It's written on very contemporary data. Some of the algorithms were around, like I mentioned, the policing algorithm. It, I was shocked to find out that some of the data they had on demographics of suburbs, the data was twelve to fifteen years old, and so things have changed. And everyone's in a rush to sell these things. There's a lot of money to be made. Um, algorithms work well if the data is, yeah, you know, we all know about good data and bad data. And data has got to be good data and reliable. And Amazon, I think, has done it well where they constantly have their algorithm learning and watching what you're doing um, and can make recommendations. So the end result of that is that there is a mutual benefit. Amazon benefits because they can sell more. But in most cases, not always, but usually uh, you and I can benefit because we get relevant recommendations made to us rather than crap that comes in the direct mail that we're not interested in. Um, of course, that's one aspect of Amazon, but the reputation of the company is gonna be affected by how they treat their employees and how they treat their shareholders and all of those other things. So we know that reputation is a, it's a lot more than than, than, than simply uh, having a good algorithm. So I'm not sure if that fully answers your question. Uh, and I'm, I guess I'm not saying that listening is gonna solve everything. I guess at the end of the day, I'm just saying listening is a fundamental part of communication. And that's the area we look at. Um, but listening can, can help in other problems because if you're listening really well, 
you do hear criticisms very early on. You hear them before they become a crisis. That constant feedback is a learning experience. And Maureen mentioned before, we both work on evaluating the World Health Organization. And we're actually calling it MEL, Measurement, Evaluation and Learning. And the biggest single benefit coming out is we are constantly learning about what people are thinking and saying, which means the organization can respond more quickly and in a more appropriate way, and hopefully avoid some of the other, the other issues that organs get, organizations get into. Uh, if you're not listening, you're probably not gonna hear things that you really ought to have heard. Okay. Well, I think uh, we're, we have, we've had a good run here, about two hours, and Jim's been talking for a long time, some good questions. Um, we'll wrap it up. I want to thank everybody for coming today and appreciate your interest. And as I said, sign up for the YouTube page, if you would, the Sydney Lectures. Do a search for Sydney Lectures on the YouTube page and sign up for that. That'd be great. And take the rest of the day off. <laughs> I, I hope it's useful all. Thank you. It was great. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Really good. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Be safe. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks. All right, Jim. Okay. Good job. Jim's gone. Um, let's look at the questions before I shut this down. I'm gonna stop recording.